All right, my friends. I just pressed the let's go live button. And so that means we got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the internets before we go ahead and get started, get nice and centered here. How we doing, my friends? The week is unfolding very nicely. It's a busy one. We got motions flying all over the place. And we got some good ones picked out for our review today. Let's make sure the tubes connect themselves. It looks like we are alive. And well, that's tremendous news. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we're talking about Judge Juan Mercon in New York. The Alvin Bragg prosecution is just about to get underway. We've got an update. Trump has been trying to get an adjournment on this case requesting the Court of Appeals in New York to review some of Judge Juan Mercan's orders, including the gag order and other motions to change venue and so on and so forth. But those courts, the Court of Appeals has denied those motions. So two different attempts from Trump have been rejected in the state of New York, which means as we were contemplating here, unless they take it away, Mercon is going to hold this trial on Monday, starting with jury selection. And so if that is the case, we are racing towards a hard trial date. And Mercon came out and he sent a letter to both sides saying, here are the instructions for jury questionnaire, for questionnaires, for voir dire, which is the process that we'll go through to pick the jurors. And we've got some jury questions that are in there. And you'll notice there's a little bit of a pattern there. The judge is asking about the Oath Keepers the three percenters and some other groups, but he's forgetting about some of the other groups on the other side. And so we'll take a look at that and what's going on there. The media also got their list of rules on what they can do. And so we'll look what's inside there. And then some reaction from an attorney general called Matt Whitaker saying, no surprise about this. A lot of this feels like it is just a process that we're going through kind of a foregone conclusion. If judge Juan Mercan is going to gag all of us from talking about his daughter who literally works for Joe Biden. Well, we kind of know where this is going, don't we? So we're going to get into it, but interesting jury questions. And this one is looking like it's going to be set to go. So we're getting prepared for it this week, making sure we have our bearing straight when this thing drops. We'll know exactly what is happening. Then we're going to talk about Stormy Daniels sticking with the Bragg prosecution. There have been some very interesting filings that have come out now including pre-motion requests by Trump's defense to get more access to some Stormy Daniels footage. Not that kind of footage, okay? Not that kind of footage, but other footage from her documentary. And that documentary footage was something that we talked about yesterday, I think it was, or maybe last week. Trump was trying to subpoena the information from NBC, who actually hosted the documentary on Peacock, if you remember. And the judge said, no, you can't have access to any of that. They're a protected news entity and a news organization, but they're not going after NBC anymore now. Trump is actually going to Stormy herself saying, well, okay, if we can't get it from NBC, perhaps we'll just get it from her saying, we've already got a subpoena out to her. She is not complying with it. And they're saying, judge, we need her compliance before we get this thing working. And this trial underway. Okay, it looks like we're good there. We've also got investigator, some investigator with Bragg's office. He has some information that Trump's defense wants as well. You can see we've got a little preview of what this document has inside, but a bunch of redactions that Trump's team says, you know, they need access to this stuff. And again, Bragg's office is burying all the discovery, dropping stuff late and trying to keep all of this stuff out of the public eye. We also have another filing about Mark Pomerantz. You remember Mark Pomerantz because we talked about him when he threw a little hissy fit. You remember him and Kerry Dunn were the two prosecutors who were there just rabid about Trump. And when Alvin Bragg won and took office, Alvin Bragg came in here and he was basically declining to prosecute Trump back then. And these guys resigned. Okay, Bragg said not going to do it. They cried. He put out this big resignation letter 
say Trump's a rah, 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 right? all the things that a guy like that, you know, would say. And so he is getting another letter. Apparently he was a former prosecutor there before Bragg took over and he resigned. So apparently he's got some interesting stuff going on. He was using his personal cell phone or something like that as being alleged or using an improper cell phone, may not have been a personal one, but an improper cell phone to uh, do his investigation. And then suddenly some materials got deleted and nobody knows where it is and all that. So that's a prosecutor, of course, in New York because the whole system there is corrupt. And then we'll listen to Weissman, who is talking about why Trump wants to avoid this going in front of the public, which is just wild because Trump and his defense have been trying to get this out in front of the public eye since the very beginning, right? If we could have this televised, you better believe they would have it televised. They gagged Trump from even commenting about this case, about any witnesses, the judge's daughter and so on. So we've also reviewed many other motions and filings from Trump's defense that are attempting to get Judge Murkan to unseal the entire case so that we can read it, but they're not publishing anything on the court docket. And of course, that feels like it's by design. They don't want us to see what's happening. And then in our final segment, we've got an appeal taking place out of Georgia. Big Fanny Land. Remember, we are already waiting on an appeal for the disqualification issue, but Trump also submitted a motion to dismiss based on the First Amendment, saying, you know, the Constitution protects his ability to speak freely and to communicate about rigged elections and that he was doing his duty as an officer, uh, as a, not an officer, as a president of the country to investigate and execute the laws by rooting out bad elections and problems like that, all the stuff. So they submitted this motion, uh, Trump and Sadow were taking the lead on it. The judge McAfee denied the motion and now Sadow is announcing that they are seeking a certificate for immediate review, which means it is the initial step of the appeal process they're going through right now. We got a clip from Vivek saying, you know, all this could lead to a historic landslide for Trump if enough people can compare what's happening here under these two administrations and come to a good conclusion. And so, as you can see, my friends, we've got a lot to get to today. We're grateful that you are here and with us. We had a beautiful members only stream this morning. We do streams for our members in the morning and we'd love to have you come join us The address there is watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We talk for about an hour, sometimes longer than that, every weekday in the mornings, and we do it on Saturday too. And so we talk about what else is going on, stuff that we can't get to here. We're pretty heavy, deep in the law here on the show, but we get into some other stuff, sometimes talk about, you know, philosophy, gardening, sovereignty, other things. So come check it out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com, and we have an amazing community there. We'd love to have you uh, join us. We got PDFs. Show notes, show reports, calendar, newsletter, merch, all the things that you might want to grab are at robertgovea.com if you want to sign up there or uh, for the newsletter, get that delivered to your inbox every day. That way you don't miss a thing. And then Sovereignty Saturday, my friends, link down in the description. We are working on solutions. We talk about a lot of problems here and we want to also be a part of the solution by freeing ourselves, creating sovereignty and freedom in our own lives so that we are insulated from the fragile world out there. We're building anti-fragility. Sovereignty Saturdays, watcherlodge.com. It's free, come join us. We had a great stream last weekend and we'd love to see you back there again on Saturday, every Saturday. So just get used to it and come join us. All right, all right, we'll love to see you there. All right, so without any further ado, oh yeah, don't forget to grab a shirt. Shopping tab is now enabled. We got some amazing Travis Matthew polos there available Nordstrom Rack or other stores and they look good, they feel good. This is a medium. They're fabulous, all right? Just grab a couple. And of course, thanks for using our link down there. The, that is a good way to support our channel and a good way to look good while you're doing it. And so, without any further ado, let's go to New York. Trump supporters now being targeted by Judge Juan Mercan. In his jury questionnaire, we have the instructions that he is proposing. We know trial is about to start any day now. April 15th is the drop dead date. And it doesn't look like that's being moved because the New York Court of Appeals has denied Trump's attempts to adjourn this case so that he can, you know, have due process of law, properly prepare for the case, review the discovery, get access to the materials that he needs to properly defend himself. They said, "Uh, you're good. Okay, we need you convicted before the election. And so we'll see you in court on Monday, starting with jury selection. So we'll take a look at what happened with the appeals. But then we're going to zoom in on the jury rules and the questions. And you'll notice The judge wants to know about Oath Keepers and Proud Boys and other groups that are usually associated with the right and 
conveniently forgets about some of the groups on the left. And we wonder why he's targeting those groups. Well, probably because he wants to check them off, make sure they're not on the board because they might be Trumpers. So we got that. The media got rules on how they're going to be reporting for this trial. So we'll talk about it and some reaction from a state AG Whitaker on the Trump trial saying, yeah, he's going into a corrupt, beastly den. And so we're going to have to just deal with it. But here is the quick background on what happened with the Court of Appeals. So Trump is losing, says the Reuters, a bid to delay the hush money trial, which is what they're calling it. We're calling it the Bragg prosecution. It's just another, you know, hack prosecutor prosecuting some hack case. And it is not a delay. It's an adjournment because they dumped a bunch of additional discovery on Trump. They've accelerated this case. Remember that we were supposed to be in the middle of the Judge Chutkin trial until that one got taken up on appeal. And so this case was actually not really on the docket until they reaccelerate. Oh, perfect. Uh, Chutkin's case got moved. So since all of the other trials are now kind of on a hiatus, we're just going to accelerate this one. Make sure we get Trump at least convicted in New York on this ridiculous case before the election is over. So Trump has been filing requests to try to postpone it. And it's not looking like that's going to happen, surprisingly. Trump on Tuesday lost his second last-ditch bid in as many days to delay his April 15th trial. Former president and his lawyers have argued at a hearing at different mid-level court of appeals. And if you want to know more about this, good logic. Right next door, Joe Nearman is right next door on YouTube, Rumble, and Locals. And he's digging into this as well about Article 78 proceedings and so on. But it's a mechanism in New York by which you can ask another entity, another judge to review a court order. And so that's what Trump's team is doing on behalf of Trump. And Good Logic is investigating this on behalf of the American people. And as a member of the press, we rely on him to bring us the news. So they say here, the former president's lawyers argued at a mid-level hearing that the trial should be delayed so he can challenge the gag order because it is irrevocable, right? You can't unring this bell. Once Trump is gagged in the middle of a political season, in the middle of 2024, you can't fix this. At the end of a, of a normal criminal trial, you say, oh man, we got to the conclusion, the jury found him guilty, but there was a real big problem in this trial. There was an evidentiary problem or that cop lied or this prosecutor did something bad. Whatever. Okay. Okay. Well, that stinks, but guess we got to do it again. Okay. So we just do the trial over again if the prosecutor's not willing to dismiss the case or whatever, or give you a smoke and plea deal to close it out. So you do it again, right? And that is normal in criminal law, which is why we normally wait till the end of the case for appeals. But we also have the 2024 election happening right now, and you can't do that over again. So if Trump is gagged, it also has a collateral consequence, not only in the court of law, but in the court of public opinion. We don't get that to hear as the American people Trump's perspective on a political issue that might be the most important for many people in the whole you know, country. Justice is important. There's nothing else that follows for that. If you don't have a valid justice system, there is no rule of law. So pass whatever law you want. Doesn't matter who's in charge because whoever's in charge is going to usurp power for their own ends because there is no law, right? That's the point. So here, the question that the main argument is Trump is saying, hey, we can't do this election over again, so we have to be able to speak now. And one of the main points of free speech is that you can challenge, petition your government for a redress of grievances, especially if you're running for office, especially if you're in the public needing to know about the person who's running for office and their opinions on the system that they happen to be in. So Associate Justice Cynthia Kern swiftly denied the delay request, meaning we're, this is probably not going anywhere, but a full panel of appeals judges will later consider the Republican candidate's underlying challenge to the gag order. So it will, it will be reviewed by another body. And I thought I read, we'll see if this article has it, but that other body is going to be scheduled to review the hearing on Monday, All right, the same day we start jury selection. So we'll see if that goes anywhere. Now, Stephen Chung, a spokesman for Trump's campaign, said in a statement, he called the trial a witch hunt. Separate judge on Monday denied another request to delay Trump's trial, saying he needed to move this out of the jurisdiction. Lawyers said that Manhattan residents had a major antipathy towards him. 61% of respondents thought Trump was guilty. 70% had a negative opinion. Now, at Tuesday's hearing, Emil Bove for Trump said Mercan's order restricting his public comment should be modified. Allow him to respond to people who are levering criticism at him, right? Stormy Daniels released a whole documentary, right? Not that kind of a documentary, I, I think. I haven't actually seen it, so who knows? 
But the new one is on Peacock, perfect platform for her. And it's all about the Trump case. It's all about you know, Stormy's life and the, the, the you know, heroism that she has gone through as a victim of Trump's brutality, whatever. Now, same thing with Michael Cohen. He's on Jen Psaki's show all the time talking to her about how, how Trump is you know, doomed, whatever. Murkan imposed a gag order and then he protected his own daughter. That's how cowardly he is, right? Uh, don't you talk about my daughter. Just like Angeron said, don't you talk about my Greenfield. The judge expanded the order to cover his relatives, his daughter who literally works for Joe Biden, literally. The order does not restrict, restrict Trump's speech about Murkan or Bragg, but it talks about his daughter, who is the most corrupt part of this entire entity. Now, he also said his office had to increase scrutiny of security due to Trump's statements. Okay, I'm sure. Michael Cohen, we know the rest of this story. So apparently, you know, this is being appealed. It's under appeal. And they're going to have a follow-up hearing very soon on this. My understanding is it's the same day that trial starts. So in other words, they're not going to delay the trial. That's already in the middle of jury selection. So brace yourselves, my friends. We should be starting trial on Monday. Now, Burkhan is expecting this to happen. Okay, he's not changing this date either. He says, we've got some jury instructions and here's how it is going to work, my friends, when you show up on Monday. This was emailed over to both sides, Todd Blanche for Trump and Joshua Steinglass for Bragg. Here's what Mercon says. All right, trial starting on Monday. So here we're talking about jury selection. Now this letter is gonna address three things. One, how we're gonna be excusing jurors. Number two, instructions about the use of an anonymous jury. And three, the jury questionnaire and the permissible scope of voir dire. Okay, so the questions the jury will be asked and how we're gonna ask further questions of them. So he says, look, now excusing jurors, if a juror self-identifies as being unable to serve, anybody in here who can't serve for any reason, they raise their hands. The court typically conducts jury selection in the following matter. Mercon says, I usually read the caption, Trump, uh, uh, Bragg versus Trump, and introduce the defendant and counsel. I identify the charges against the defendant, outline the nature of the case, and provide a brief summary of the allegations. Now, the court invited the parties to give us a summary, oh man, of the case. This is so gross. So the court invited the parties to submit a one paragraph summary of the case to be read to the juries, jurors, right? The judge is gonna basically frame the case out. It's like your introduction paragraph. Now the parties were unable to agree on the language and therefore we got separate versions. Now after carefully considering the proposed versions, the court has crafted what I believe, ugh, is a fair and appropriate narrative of the case, great. Is he going to call it a federal insurrection case again? Trump is a federal insurrection defendant. You know, whatever. Including the defendant denies the allegations. Now, okay, that's great. That's good because we have the presumption of innocence. Thanks, Judge. Now, the summary is attached. We'll read it. The pr purpose of the narrative is to provide the prospective jurors a fair and balanced summary and to assist them with understanding the nature of the case. The purpose is not to instruct the jury on the law, nor is it to present competing arguments. So we'll see how you guys feel about that instruction. Writing, I explained the judge, among other things, what an indictment is, my process, basic principle about the law, you can't hold somebody not testifying against them. I'll explain to the jurors that the observance of Passover does not preclude them from serving, and I conclude my preliminary instructions, I read the following, okay? Now that you've heard my instructions, some basic information, let me know, please do not wait until you after, after you've been selected to tell me you can't be fair and impartial. Is there anyone here who can't serve? Let me know now by raising your hand, right? I'm not going to excuse you because of inconvenience, blah, blah, blah. So I then invite those jurors who have self-identified who wish to be excused. The judge says, this is what I'm going to tell them. Then they're going to raise their hands if they, you know, anybody who can't handle it. Line up at the rail, approach the bench individually and, and explain why they should be excused. Now, I then invite them to come up. Now, we are joined at the bench by the defense, the prosecution, the court reporter, at least one or more court clerks if they've not waived their rights. And in my experience, the vast majority, if not all, who have self-identified as being unable to serve are, in fact, excused at this stage. Right. So he says, I normally do this and I normally bring them up and ask them questions. Now, in the matter in a previous case, when I handled a prior Trump case, so this judge has been on this Trump on like multiple Trump cases. He says, I presided over this one in 2022. I proposed that we just stop interviewing them if they say I can't serve. 
Okay, so the ordinary ways they come, I can't serve. Oh yeah, why not? Oh yeah, because you got a bad knee, that's too bad. Get a brace, see in court, right? One of those things. So now the judge is saying, well, I didn't really want to ask people why they can't serve. And the reason probably, reading between the lines here, is probably because these are honest people who say, I hate Trump. Hey, how about you? I hate this guy's guts. Oh, thanks, next person. How about you? Yeah, same, hate him. How about you? Hate, oh yeah, I hate him. I love Hillary Clinton. She's my hero. Hey, how about you? Love huge Joe Biden fan, right? So all, and, and then the, the, the judge will be like, oh crap, oh crap. Well, boom, 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 you know? So he's like, so how about we just don't ask, okay? Don't ask, don't tell policy on why the jurors are unable to serve. So back then, the defense counsel at that prior case, they objected. They said, what? No, you don't get, like, we want to know why. Like, we want to know if it's a legitimate excuse or not. Now he says, and we deferred. And so while most Supreme Court trials typically involve one or two defense attorneys or one or two prosecutors, we had four and we had equal prosecutor. We had a bunch of people here. And so the process described above couldn't be conducted at the bench, all right? So the judge just says, oh, there's too many people up here. Eh. We don't want everybody coming up here. And so the process was time consuming, not enough room, right? The judge is gonna get rid of a critical point of the case because there's not enough room. <laughs> okay, so the process was time consuming and it was unproductive. So upon finishing the first jury panel, then we dispense now that the defense counsel con consented, we got rid of the in individual interviews. And so then we accelerated the process. Maybe, so maybe they accelerated it. So then in the instant matter, we're gonna have all those people and even more plus Trump and the Secret Service, and the jury room is not large enough to accommodate this. And so this would require everyone going to the 15th floor if we wanna go through this. And in a case where security concerns are now implicated, moving the entire jury panel is simply not gonna happen. So against this backdrop, the court proposed eliminating the individual's interviews of the jurors. If they say, hey, I can't be on here. Now, after some suggestions and discussion, Mr. Blanche, Trump's lawyer in this case, shout out says, okay, well, how about we do a hybrid system? Okay, let's, let's break this up. But they say that Mr. Blanche offered no alternative. Yeah, right, no practical alternative, right? So the judge says, well, I don't like that idea. So this court finds after very careful consideration that requiring individual inquiry of every juror who has already identified that they can't be fair or, they, or they're unable to serve, we don't really know why, is unnecessary. We're not gonna do it. So the first department is held. It was not an error to do this. And so I'm allowed to do this. And so all this case law says I'm authorized to do this. And so we're not going to interview them if they say I'm unfit to serve. Just, okay, fine. Have a nice life. Got that. So point one is done. Now, how about point two about an anonymous jury? They say on March 7th, this court issued its decision in order on Bragg's motion for a protective order regulating the disclosure of juror information. Here's what I said back then, says the judge. So I ordered that the people's motion for a protective order restricting the disclosure of business or residential addresses other than to lawyers is granted, right? So only attorneys get sensitive info of the jurors. Also ordered that Bragg's motion to prohibit the disclosure of juror names other than to parties other than counsel is also granted including Trump staff and other people, consultants and so on. So juror information goes to everybody other than the public. And also that the people in the council for Trump shall jointly submit to this court, propose neutral explanations to minimize prejudice. Okay, so when explaining why something is happening or not, if they're unable to agree on language, they can submit proposals. Now the parties were unable again to come to an agreement and we got separate instructions. Now, we know that the process of summoning thousands of additional jurors and, 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 and imposing all of these necessary measures is a lot. And we have a lot of people working on this. Commissioner of jurors for the county. We got this, you know, all these people working on it. And they formulated a plan. Now, in his proposal, Trump requests that his proposed instruction not be read to jurors unless they express concerns about the public attention in the case. The court will make clear, make every effort, to not necessarily alert the jurors to the reality that this will be anonymous, right? So the defense doesn't want the jurors to be told that they're like in danger, right? Hey, you guys, this is an anonymous jury because like you guys are in danger or something. Like what, I'm in danger, why? Because Trump, oh great, guilty. However, as a necessary measure to ensure anonymity, 
The jurors must be given an instruction before they enter the courtroom when they arrive in the jury room. And so we've drafted some instructions. And here's the instruction. Now the court and both parties have agreed your names will not be publicly disclosed. Further, your addresses will not be shared. We are doing this to preserve your privacy and you may not draw any inferences in favor of or you know, against either party or result of this order. All right, and you might say that's pretty you know, reasonable. You know, the downside from the public's perspective is that the defense attorneys miss something, right? So we've seen other cases where jurors were very problematic. I think of the Derek Chauvin case to be more specific. There was one juror on that case who said that he was fair and impartial, even though he went to a George Floyd protest sometime before. Okay, so the guy who's judging Derek Chauvin, who was now convicted for murder, went to a George Floyd protest. Hmm. So that's fair and impartial, according to the DA there. Now, on February 21st, Assistant DA Steinglass informed the court that pursuant to the court request, we got further, we conferred further and have reached an agreement to several of the proposed jury questions. We're now in the jury questionnaire. We're going to get to some of the questions targeting the Trumpers here in a minute. So they say, we continue to disagree. So we're not going to come to a, a similar conclusion. Now, the, the judge tells us the court has closely scrutinized all the proposed questions that are going to be on the jury questionnaire, including those to which the parties have agreed to. Now, guided by legal authority and the requirements under the law, the court has modified some and we've excluded others. Now, the resulting questionnaire that the jurors will get is broad and exhaustive, says the judge. 42 questions we'll take a look at, many of which contain sub-questions covering all the relevant areas of the inquiry. Please note, no questions asking the jurors whom they voted for or who they intend to vote for or whom they've made political contributions to. Yeah, you definitely don't want to know that in New York because we know where that's going to lead, lead us. Nor are jurors, but, but pay attention because they're going to ask other questions that will get to this. Like they're still trying to identify these people, but they're just not going to ask that. Nor are the jurors asked about their specific political party registration Though the answer to that question may be easily gleaned from the responses to other questions. Yes, counsel is forewarned not to seek to expand the degree of intrusion beyond what's already been approved. Now, they say turning to counsel's questions of the jurors, the court shall not permit questioning that is repetitious. And I have discretion to, to narrow the scope of the inquiry. And so thus, contrary to Trump's arguments, the purpose of the jury selection is not to determine whether they like or dislike the parties. No, that's irrelevant. The ultimate issue is can they set aside those feelings or biases? I hate Donald Trump's guts. Oh, really? That's too bad. Can you set that aside here while you're judging him on trial to see if you can convict him? Can you set that aside? Yes, I can. Clearly. I'm a good lefty liberal. I'm all for equal law protection. No one's above the law. Right. All right, you see how this goes. So most, if not all jurors, bring some dispositions. It's only when it's shown that there is a substantial risk that it's going to affect their ability to discharge their duties does it become a problem. And so counsel is reminded that a challenge for cause to boot these jurors off may only be made on the ground that they're not qualified by the judiciary law. And so he's putting some pretty, you know, uh, nice roadblocks up to stop Trump from kicking off good jurors for their side. Indeed, it appears that counsel for Trump is in agreement. Of course, the mere fact that someone's a Democrat or a Republican does not give either party, I would submit, the right to strike for cause. So it's, it's amazing. This judge is such a piece of work. He's, quote, he's quoting the defense like, oh, you agree with me. And he's just pulling something from their transcript. Yeah, it's not the mere fact. Yeah, you're probably right, but the, but it's not going to be the mere fact. It's going to be a lot more than that, right? So here is the statement that the judge cobbled together. He says, okay, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my friends, you're playing jury today. So you come in, you sit down. You have no idea what the heck's going on. Never been on a jury panel before. Judge comes out, reads this for you, says, all right, the allegations are in substance that Donald Trump falsified business records to conceal an agreement with others to unlawfully influence the 2016 presidential election. And so we're asking ourselves, okay, how is that? What crime was that? What, what are you charging there? Specifically, it is alleged that Trump made or used false business records, right? Which is this case 
to hide the true nature of the payments made to Michael Cohen by characterizing them as payment for legal services rendered pursuant to a retainer agreement. So it is literally Cohen sent an invoice. They put it into a ledger. Then the ledger caused the check to be written, which went back over to Michael Cohen. It's a simple retainer agreement. They said every single one of those is a different felony. So crime, crime, crime every single month. That's how you get the 34 charges. The people allege, brag, that the payments were intended to reimburse Michael Cohen for money that he paid to Stormy in the weeks before the election to prevent her from publicly re revealing details about a past encounter with Trump. So Trump has pleaded not guilty and denies the allegations. And we're asking ourselves about what the other crime was, right? In, under New York law, it's in, you're falsifying the business records in order to conceal another crime that's being committed. And we're asking ourselves, what is that other crime? Time will tell. Now, this is what they get. This looks like they get printed. This gets printed out. Hey, juror, please take part D of your juror summon. And in the upper right hand corner is going to be your number. And do this. You will be called and identified only by this number and respond when you get called. Now, when they sit down, they get a clipboard, they get a pen. These are the questions that the Trump jurors will get. When you're finished answering, we're gonna move on to the next seated juror until every juror has had the opportunity to answer. Oh, this is what they're gonna ask them in court. Okay, so it's not actually a written questionnaire. Depending on your answer, we may have follow-up questions. When you're finished answering all of these, we're gonna to go to the next juror until every juror has had the opportunity to answer. Okay, so it sounds like it's like, hey, write your answers out. We're gonna just go through the line. Give us your answers. Got it? Okay. Without telling us your address, where do you live? Upper East Side, Lower West Side, wherever. How long you live there? You a native New Yorker? If not, when'd you move? What do you do for a living? How long you been doing that? And if you're retired, what'd you do before you retired? Who's your current employer? How large are they? Are you self-employed? Do you own your own business? Who's your prior employer? And what's your educational background, Mr. Juror? High school, diploma, college degree, graduate degree. Are you married? Have you ever been married? Do you have any kids? If you are married or living with another adult, what does that person do? If you have adult children, what do they do? What do you do in your spare time? Do you plan insurrections? Do you have any interests or hobbies? Do you participate in organizations or advocacy groups, right? That's a broad question. Which one's there? Have you ever served on a jury before? If you did, please tell us how long ago. Was it criminal, civil, or grand jury? And without telling us the verdict, did they reach a verdict? Now, which of the following print publications cable and or network programs or online media such as websites blogs or social media do you visit huh so if you're on the jury panel got to fill this out new york times usa today huffington post daily news cnn msnbc google facebook x TikTok, wall street journal new york post newsday washington post fox news newsmax msnbc Yahoo and True Social. Eh. Any juror who marks that is gone. Kick, you're gone. You're deleted. In fact, probably charged with a crime. I don't follow the news, is the last one. So you see a couple of these boxes. Prosecutors are going to be checking those off. Defense attorney is going to be looking at, well, you know, every other one of these is essentially like if they're Washington Post, if they're Daily News, New York Times, let's if they're Huffington Post, example. You're going, uh-oh, okay. Here's a question. Do you listen to or watch podcasts? If so, which one? Watching the Watchers? Huh? Get off that jury so fast. Yeah, be gone. Do you listen to talk radio? If so, which programs? Which are basically all, you know, conservative, most of them, like Sean Hannity, you know. Have you, a relative or a close friend, ever been the victim of a crime? Standard question. If so, please briefly ask, tell us what happened. Do you have some you know, feelings about the justice system after having been the victim of a crime. Have you or a relative or close friend ever been employed by law enforcement? Got, you know, feds, police in the chat, in the jury. Have you or a relative ever been employed by the government 
Have you ever been employed in the accounting or the finance field? Because this is an accounting crime, so-called. Have you, a relative or a close friend, ever had any education, training, or work experience in the legal field? Are you going to commandeer the jury? Have you or anyone ever, ever had any experience which caused you to form an opinion with, about police? If so, what was that experience? And would that experience prevent you from being fair and impartial? New York jurors are asked, have you, a relative or close friend, ever been accused or convicted of committing a crime? Do you have a pending criminal case? Question 21, do you have any political, moral, intellectual, or religious beliefs that stop you from following the court's instructions? Same thing that would prevent you from rendering a verdict, any religious, moral objections. Any health conditions might cause a problem? You take any medications that might stop you from being able to concentrate? Don't tell us the names, but let us know if you're on them. Hunter Biden's off the list. Court proceedings normally end around 4.30. Can you make it through that? Would your schedule allow you to do that? Do you practice any religion that would prevent you from sitting here on a weekday or weeknight? Can you give us assurance that you're going to be fair and impartial and not base your decision against a person who may appear, appear on this case? based on the person's race, color, origin, ancestry, gender, gender identity, expression, religious views, blah, 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 all the way up to political views, right? Politics. Can you be fair and impartial? Can you promise to guard against allowing stereotypes or bias to influence you? Do you have a relative or a close friend? Has anyone ever worked for any of the Trump companies? Hmm. If you are, maybe you might like him. Maybe you need to go. Have you, a relative or a close friend, ever worked or volunteered for a Trump presidential campaign, Trump presidential administration, any other political entity affiliated with Trump, right? Now, you'll notice they're not going to ask about, I, I would imagine, we're going to get to the bottom of this here in a minute, but they're not going to ask, um, are, do you work for the New York government? Like, do you work for the government? Do you, do you, do you have a maybe a predisposition to believing the government since your employer is a government, you get paid by the government? So in other words, if somebody worked for Trump, they're conflicted. Okay, well, what if somebody works for the government that employs Alvin Bragg? Are they conflicted too? Have you ever attended a rally or a campaign event for Trump? Or how about Bragg? Or how about Tish James? Or how about Angeron? Or any of these other people in this vicinity? Ever attend their events? Any questions on that, Judge? Let's see. Are you signed up for, or have you ever been subscribed to or followed any newsletter or email listserv run on behalf of Mr. Trump or the Trump organization. So do you get Trump emails? Hmm. Again, no Alvin Bragg email questions. No Tish James questions. Do you follow Donald Trump on any social media or have you done so in the past? If you do, might need to go. Have you, a relative or a close friend, ever worked or volunteered for any anti-Trump group or organization? Hmm. We'll see if they answer honestly this time. Have you ever attended a rally or any campaign event for any anti-Trump group or organization? And again, like we've seen where they've lied about this. We saw in the Derek Chauvin case, a very similar question was asked and the juror lied about that and there was no recourse. There was no appeal, nothing. Are you signed up for, or have you ever signed up for or followed any newsletter or any email listserv run by on behalf of any anti-Trump group or organization? And again, you know, we're going to see like what that means. What is an anti-Trump group? Is Bragg anti-Trump? I would say yes. Anybody make a donation to Bragg? Anybody support work for them? Newsletter for Bragg? He's pretty anti-Trump. How about the entire DNC? They're going to say, no, no, it's just a Hillary Clinton thing. Do you currently follow any anti-Trump group or organization on social media? Have you done so in the past? They're not going to identify them themselves as anti-Trump. They're pro-America. So here's a big question, right, that you see how this balance weighs out. Have you ever considered yourself a supporter or belong to any of the following? The QAnon movement, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Boogaloo Boys, and Antifa, right, which you would presume that most of these are associated with the right, associated with Trump. They're not asking us about BLM. Did you ever get, do you ever support BLM? Anybody on this jury panel? No. How about the ACLU? Anybody ever support the ACLU here? Uh, no questions on that. 
How about the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center? Anybody here support that? Southern Poverty Law Center? Or maybe how about the Anti-Defamation League? Anybody here supporting that one? So none of those questions, right? Or any of these groups, they say that these are uh, you know opposite groups and you can't talk about their groups, right? That's a no-no. Do you have any strong opinions or firmly held beliefs about whether a former president may be criminally charged in state court? If you think this is like unconstitutional, you gotta let us know. Do you have any feelings or opinions about how Trump is being treated in this case? If you think this is unfair, you gotta go. Can you give us your assurance you're gonna decide this case solely on the evidence you see in this courtroom? Do you have any strong opinions about Trump or the fact that he is a current candidate for president? Is that gonna impact you from being fair? Have you read or listened to any of these podcasts or any of these people's books? from Michael Cohen or from Mark Pomerantz? If so, let us know. And if you read it, can you still be fair and impartial? And they're, oh yeah, totally. Disloyal, a memoir. I think that was Cohen, I don't know. Mea Culpa, the podcast, Cohen. People versus Trump, that might've been Pomerantz, I don't know. Revenge, is that Cohen, another book? Man, he just keeps publishing books trying to make a buck. And all his weird fans are like, yeah! more Cohen. How could you want more Michael Cohen? Oh my gosh. Now the defendant in this case has written a number of books. Have you read or listened to one of Trump's books? If so, which one? And do you have any opinions about the legal limits about political contributions? Can you promise to set aside anything you've heard and follow the law? And can you give your absolute assurance that you're going to refrain from watching this case with anyone in any manner from watching, reading, or listening to any of the information in this case. And can you assure us that you're gonna follow the judge's instructions on reasonable doubt and the presumption of innocence? They say the constitution has no burden for Trump to introduce any evidence. If Mr. Trump chooses not to testify or to introduce any evidence, can you give us your assurance that you're not gonna hold that against him? Is there any reason, bias or otherwise, that would prevent you from being fair and impartial if you're selected? in this case, and that is the conclusion of the jury instruction. So the judge doing his very best to try to root out any potential mega jurors, lest they interfere with the conclusion and the outcome that they want in this case. The media also got their instructions. You see here, date is jury selection started following, followed by the trial, room 1523, closed circuit audio visual feed. So we don't get to watch any of this. Courtroom opens 9.30 a.m. Press can arrive 7 to 7.45. This trial is going to go six to eight weeks, but Wednesdays are not in session. So we'll be here Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday with trial coverage. Wednesdays, we'll get another update on whatever else is happening. Trial seating. So 114 seats. Press pool organized of six journalists and one courtroom sketch artist. No sketches of jurors allowed. Overflow room, 58 journalists can apply. Seats are first come, first serve. Exit of the building, one seat per outlet, per news outlet. Pool and reserve seats, 750 for the balance of the seat. Still video. So you see, right? Now here are the rules. Press with approved credentials can use laptops. Okay, so... If they're inside these rooms, then they can use laptops, probably watch it and then live tweet it. No cell phone use, no video, no photographs, no audio recording. Journalists may pack lunch, but no glass containers. Cell phones can only be used in that room for texting. Otherwise, you're limited. So it, the trial is, again, locked down as can be. They don't want us to see anything that's happening here because they are prosecuting and trying to eviscerate their political opponents, and it's disgusting. So we know what's happening in New York. It's corrupt, it's political. This is an attorney general called Matthew Whitaker explaining the same. Matt, really not a surprise. They asked for a delay to get a new judge. They asked for a delay to get a new location. No and no. Yeah, it's not surprising that New York doesn't want to give up its grasp, especially Manhattan. But, you know, if you look at the numbers, the, the president's filing included a poll of 2,000 people in New York County, which is Manhattan. <clears throat> and what it found was 61 percent of those people polled think that Donald Trump is guilty of these crimes. Secondly, in 2020, um, New York City voted by 76 percent to 23 percent for Joe Biden. So obviously getting a fair jury panel 
uh, is all is impossible. Now, all this court said is, well, let's try to pick a jury and see if we can get of uh, uh, 12 people that can be fair and impartial. But I, I worry that many, because of the high profile nature of this case, are going to want to be on this jury and aren't going to be honest with the court during jury selection. It's Absolutely. Very Clearly. It's a city of activists. Right I don't know if people notice. Uh, that's who's stopping Trial our roads the every day. They accuse President Trump of uh, falsifying, lying about 34 business records, 12 ledger extensions, 11 invoices, and 11 checks. But the source is Michael Cohen. He's got some, eth he's got some uh, um, truth problems. He is a convicted perjurer. He has lied and lied to Congress. And there are allegations that he lied again in the Letitia James case because Alina Abba was questioning him about this. And he says, basically, yeah, I was dishonest there. So a federal judge has already confirmed their star witness is a lying hack. Alvin Bragg wanted to dismiss this case. Southern District of New York, the feds dismissed it. Judge Murkan has a biased daughter who is literally working for Joe Biden and other Democrat candidates adverse to Trump. But he's scheduled the trial to go because they are beginning with the end in mind. They've already got an outcome that they are trying to reach. The trial's just an annoyance, okay? They're just driving towards a conviction, a felony conviction that they can continue to rub around all of America throughout the 2024 election season. But I think that people are going to start to wake up and realize ultimately what's happening here. It is a kangaroo court and we're going to be part of the effort to expose it, bringing the truth of what's happening to light as we cover this trial and the other Trump litigation here. And we appreciate you joining us as our coverage continues, my friends. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you for liking this video. Thank you for inviting a friend or family member to come over and join us or just for simply sharing this video with someone you know or love, letting them know what's happening here. We'll look forward to seeing you on our members only community as well at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. If you wanna catch some additional content, some morning streams, some Saturday streams, we'd love to have you join us. We'll see you there and back here on the next one. All right, my friends. Now, we got some subpoena action that we are about to get into. And it's about Stormy. Trump subpoenas Stormy Daniels wants some of that documentary footage, not that kind of footage, the kind that she made for a platform called Peacock, NBC's platform where they post TV shows and apparently terrible documentaries. They have a bunch of footage there, not only the footage that is publicly available, but what about all the stuff that got cut out of the final film? What about all the emails and all the exchanges and the research and the investigation? The whole case is talked about in this documentary. It's about Stormy and Trump's life. So why can't Trump get access to those materials so that he can review them to prepare his defense to see what went into the creation of this ridiculous film? So we've got, that is now being debated. We also have an investigator who apparently has some interesting discovery because it's all being redacted in Trump's defense and their demand for this. And Mark Pomerantz, apparently had some questionable things going on with his records when he was also in the New York prosecutor's office. So here's what is now going on with Stormy Daniels. And this is being sent to Judge Juan Mercan from Trump's defense to the Honorable pff, Judge Juan Mercan says, hey, dear Judge McCann, we've got some questions for you here about Stephanie Clifford, a.k.a. Stormy Daniels. We are submitting this pre-motion letter and we're seeking leave. We want you to enforce the subpoena that we submitted on Stephanie Clifford, specifically requests one and two. The subpoena has been attached and the affidavit also, but as a courtesy, we also want to explain what happened. So Trump says, we are going after those materials. We sent a subpoena, we served her with the document and we sent the service to her lawyer. Now his name is Clark Brewster. In the email, Brewster claimed, he said, oh no, you didn't serve my client. We're not accepting this. The subpoena was returnable on March 29th and we are here, March 29th has come and gone and neither Brewster nor Clifford have responded to our subpoena or filed a motion to quash. So the subpoena is still valid and we demand that we get those documents soon. With the exception of paragraph 1P, request one seeks records of the production, the release, the compensation, right? To talk about bias. How much money did you get, Stormy, to create this fictional story for your Peacock fans? And related disclosures to the people 
regarding Stormy's documentary. Now, Clifford's work with NBC Universal here was done to monetize her status as a witness in this case, to enhance the commercial success of the documentary, to prejudice potential jurors against Trump, and to promote the film and release the film literally just one week before the scheduled start of the jury selection here. That's clearly bias, motive, and hostility under the rules. And so while we do not agree that the rules protect NBC Universal from giving us their discovery, it certainly does apply to Clifford. Does not apply to Clifford, and she needs to get us these materials. Now we seek also communications between Stormy and Michael Cohen, these two potential little lovebirds, some people were saying, and Karen McDougal, and potential hearsay declarants, E. Jean Carroll, Jessica Leeds, and Natasha Stoinoff. Now, communications between two fact witnesses and confirmation that the communications were deleted, maybe Stormy and Cohen deleted their texts. Oh, no. That constitutes admissible evidence of bias and hostility arising from the strong inference that the witnesses communicated in order to corroborate their false testimony. Stormy and Cohen lying. Now, communications between Stormy and other women who have sought to also monetize their claims against Trump are also probative of Stormy's intent to do the same through post to, through false trial testimony. Now, at a minimum, we are entitled to two types of responsive materials about these requests. First, Stormy Daniels has communicated with Michael Cohen's. We know it. It was about the allegations in this case, including in connection with her appearances on his podcast. Ugh. Imagine that room, walking in the room after Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen finished a two-hour podcast. Ugh. Second, Kathy Griffin has stated publicly that she participates, Kathy Griffin, the severed head comedian, so-called, in multi-party electronic communications that include both Stormy and E. Jean Carroll on a daily basis. They have an anti-Trump TDS Dementoid group chat. President Trump is entitled to evidence of this. It shows bias, motive, and hostility under the state and federal constitutions. And evidence is appropriately subject to our subpoena that's already been issued, and particularly in light of public confirmation of some of these communications. We know they were talking, and they deleted their communications. They are not giving them to us, and we demand them immediately. So that is just the pre-motion letter. We'll see what Bragg says about this. And of course, trial's right around the corner. So if Trump doesn't get it, they're going to pitch a fit about it at the trial, and we'll see what the judge does. But that is not the only filing that Trump's team submitted after they are now on the warpath to get more discovery with trial right around the corner. There's also this redacted filing from this investigator, which is curious. And here's what they sent in to Judge Murkan about this guy. They say, all right, Your Honor, we're seeking leave now to enforce another subpoena served on this guy, supervising rackets investigator called Jeremy Rosenberg. His name is right here. He's in Brooklyn, New York. We sent him a subpoena on March 18th to compel the production of responsive documents. Now, the subpoena is attached as Exhibit A. Now, an affidavit of service is also attached, so we know he got it. Email correspondence also confirms this, and the subpoena was returnable, but he has not responded to this, and he's not filed a motion to quash. So they're just ignoring subpoenas, knowing the court's not going to do crap about it. Now, here's the subpoena. They say the subpoena is a valid demand for documents. Okay, we submitted it. The District Attorney of New York did something. Redacted, 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 redacted. They say Bragg's office has disclosed redacted. But the completeness and the integrity of that collection is dubious at best because Bragg relied on voluntary compliance from someone. So we don't know what that even means. They got a bunch of materials. They gave us the materials. And they say, here's everything we got. But what's in those materials and where'd they come from? Voluntary compliance from whom? Maybe it's Stormy. Maybe it's from Cohen. We don't know. Now, for example, Bragg already found that redacted, 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 and redacted, redacted. Now, the reliability of the phone evidence, or as we see it, the lack thereof, it's probably Cohen or Stormy. 
okay, we got all this from Cohen, but they deleted it. Or, or they just gave us voluntarily whatever they said was on it, right? Now, the reliability will be an important disputed trial as Bragg seeks to persuade jurors to accept the testimony of a perjurer, Michael Cohen, with false statements and fraud convictions. Yeah, he has both of those. And he's the star witness in the case. It's like, it's like a joke of a prosecution, but okay. Now, President Trump agrees with Bragg that blank, 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 wonder what that is, consistent with the foregoing redacted, Exhibit C reflects the flippant and dismissive approach that Rosenberg took in response to the subpoena. He didn't care. Despite ample evidence with the experience with the criminal justice system that should have instilled with him a respect for this process, he didn't care. As a result, this subpoena is necessary to ensure that Trump has access to all these communications. And we need to confirm whether evidence was spoiled. Now, this evidence is admissible to challenge the integrity of evidence that Bragg is going to seek to offer. They're going to introduce evidence from Cohen's phones. We need this to show the opposite. We're also going to use this in cross-examination of Cohen's phones about his bias and his hostility to Trump that's reflected in his blank. What is that? And to attack the lack of integrity of Bragg's investigation under federal constitution cases such as so-and-so. Reflected in his what? What is it, like his personal journal? Something? President Trump is entitled to this specific evidence of motive, hostility, and bias. And so the subpoena should be enforced, sincerely signed by your friend Todd Blanche. So that is interesting, right? This guy got a valid subpoena. You see, this is what it looks like from Todd Blanche. Uh, affirmation of service. Guy got served. There's the subpoena with the various requests. And... Apparently, this dude is not communicating at all. So they send him a subpoena. He says, I don't have any files for you. From Jeremy to Todd. Hey, Todd, here's a subpoena. Uh, here's an indictment subpoena. Uh, please give us your documents. Wow, this guy's kind of rude. He's an investigator. I don't have any files for, for you. Sincerely, Jeremy. P.S. The phone number you provided is disconnected. P.P.S. I'm keeping the $15 whatever that means. So he says, okay, Mr. Rosenberg, thanks for the email. I'm confirming that you do not have counsel representing you in response to the subpoena. Sorry, the number didn't work. Here's my cell phone. You can use it to the extent we need to communicate going forward. Here's the number. Do you have counsel representing you? He says, no, I believe Alvin Bragg is representing the people of New York. He's their investigator. Okay. Thanks, man. So thanks for your help. So just totally ignoring a subpoena, right? They, they don't care. It's New York. They know the judges are going to enforce anything or hold them accountable. Trump has no process rights, basically, at all. And speaking of process rights, so this guy, Mark Pomerantz, has some questionable behavior that is now being called out by Trump's defense as well. Remember, Mark Pomerantz was one of the two people who was originally prosecuting Trump. Alvin Bragg was not elected yet. Cyrus Vance brought in these guys as consultants, and then Cyrus Vance left, didn't run for re-election. Alvin Bragg came in, took over the DA's office, and he said they were not going to prosecute this case. And Mark Pomerantz threw a crybaby hissy fit, and he resigned. He wrote this resignation letter blasting Bragg. And then what happened after that? Matthew Colangelo came over from, I believe, the Biden DOJ and then helped them. Or maybe he came from Tish's office. Either way, he's worked for both of them. So he's been helping to prosecute Trump. Colangelo comes in, Bragg brings the case back to life. But Pomerantz had already resigned, so he'd been working on this case for quite some time. And he's getting some questions as well. This is an affirmation of Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, saying we need to subpoena Mark Pomerantz. He's trying to quash the subpoena. He says, here's the deal. I represent Trump. We sent a subpoena to Mark. Now, here's what happened. Attached is a true copy of some email communications that we sent back and forth concerning Pomerantz and blank, whatever that is, attached to the people's email. Now, here's a true and accurate copy of this stuff. Now, the email is about the production of redacted. And here's a true and accurate copy of whatever that was produced. And we request 
you deny the subpoena to Pomerantz. Now look at all of these redactions. I'm just going to uh, fast forward through a lot of this. So if you're looking at this document, it says there's 52 pages. It says here we reiterate that we've complied with everything that you need. This is from Rebecca Mangold, assistant DA. Her name is Becky. That's nice. We remain available to discuss anything if you need. We've reviewed the redactions. And here, here is what this looks like. So let me fast forward through a lot of this to show you all of these black pages. Okay, so these are the redactions that are in this filing. Now, when we fast redaction, redact page 26 redacted, 29 redacted, 33 redacted, 35 redacted, 38. Now we're on exhibit two. So exhibit two here is curious. They tell us, this is, an, this is a letter now from the DA's office, Becky, and we're gonna continue to fast forward to exhibit three and continue on. There was a very good, interesting exchange in a letter from Todd Blanche. This is all redacted. So 46 redacted, 47, 48. Now we're at exhibit four. So let's get caught up now. The date is now March 13th, right? These are all filings that are just starting to uh, get dropped. And remember, trial's right around the corner. So the original trial date at the time this letter was sent was March 25th. So we were just a short time away. So Todd Blanche sends this in to Alvin Bragg's office. And this is regarding Mark Pomerantz. So he says, okay, dear Miss Mangold, now we write in response to the late produced discovery that was provided to Trump tonight at 8.04 p.m. This is how this case is working. March 13th, we've got just about two weeks before trial. 8.04 p.m., they dump 100,000 pages. I'm sorry, similar to the more than 100,000 of pages of whatever this is that you've produced over the last two weeks. It's extremely difficult for us to understand how this information could be produced by FOIA and yet not be produced to Bragg's office in a timely fashion at the very beginning of this case. So over the last two weeks, like within a month of trial, they get 100,000 new pages of discovery and they just dropped another one at 8.04 on March 13th. Moreover, says Todd, sending us discoverable blank, discoverable whatever this is, strongly suggests that Bragg's office still has not collected in a systematic fashion all of Mr. Pomerantz's communications about the benefits and the efforts to obtain benefits for Michael Cohen. Which, can you understand what's happening here? Of course you can, because it's clear as day. It's corruption! Mr. Pomerantz, a former prosecutor, is trying to get benefits for Mr. Cohen, and then those records are missing. Strongly suggest that you don't have all of his communications that a prosecutor had with Cohen nor has Bragg produced any similar communications about Clifford or other Bragg witnesses that also may have been provided benefits. Now, the defense says we are in no position to be able to tell whether the issue is one of more than one Bragg not carefully searching the phone that Pomerantz was using to send text messages. So did you just not check the phone or that could be a problem. Maybe that's why we don't have this because you didn't, just didn't look hard enough on the phone. That's one. Or maybe Mark was using improperly a private cell phone to conduct official business. Could that have been an issue? Maybe that's why you don't have all the records. Or maybe it's because Pomerantz was deleting messages that have been recovered more recently from other sources. Hmm. However you splice it, not good. So any and all of these options are troubling following last month's untimely production of this material, whatever that is, and given where we are in this case. So information regarding any and all of these options is also discoverable as we try to impeach Cohen under case law as to the integrity of this investigation. And we require complete disclosures promptly about all of these issues and what you've done to address them. And furthermore, Trump's defense says to the government, these blank, 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 and blank, 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 blank. Either Pomerantz drafted that letter on 
Bragg's systems, in which case you have the drafts and you must produce them, or he drafted the letter on an outside system, in which case you must disclose that breach and you must seek to collect the documents directly from him. So where did he get these materials? No privilege can be claimed over the draft letter, some draft letter apparently, as it is obvious from the produced blank that the letter was read or discussed with Cohen's counsel. Maybe it's a, re a re red receipt or something, or billing entry or something. Now it's equally clear that there were communications with Bragg regarding whether and to what extent to provide the benefit that Cohen was seeking and that Pomerantz apparently promised Cohen. And I don't even know what that is. What is this benefit? Promised to Cohen, Miss Perry, and Mr. Davis. You have not produced all those internal communications either. And as we explained in our discovery motion, you have relied, at least in part, on unacceptable and indefensible invocations of the work product privilege to withhold constitutionally mandated discovery. As with the text message issue here, your failure to do so up until this point is troubling. We require complete disclosure and we require it promptly regarding drafts of the letter and communications regarding its content. And so exhibit five, uh, more redactions. Okay, so very shady stuff happening here. You've got prior prosecutors who have like you know, one of three things, fake you know, uh, searches for evidence, private cell phones, or he's actually deleting evidence that's part of the investigation. And apparently some type of benefits, like I don't know, witness protection, something's got, I don't know what the heck is going on. These, what are these payments, these receipts, these invoices, did he put them up in a hotel? What's going on? Well, we don't know, but Bragg and the corrupt prosecutors in the DA's office are continuing to cover it up, right? If this case is so clear, why isn't the court docket being publicized? It's not at all. There have been motions from Trump's defense to try to unseal it all so we can see it. The judge said, well, you have enough. Just come in and watch it in court. This is Weissman who is gaslighting his entire audience, okay? Bragg's case is one of the most locked down that we've seen of all time. You can't even access the criminal docket on their court public uh, uh, site, right? We're getting these documents from Todd Blanche and from other people who are actually litigating this case and pulling the filings. So here is Weissman on MSNBC saying Trump is the person who wants to hide all of this. The Supreme Court said there is when you've got a case of such notoriety that everywhere you go in the United States, people are going to hear about it. The idea that you need to transfer the case makes no sense. Again, the remedy is having a very careful jury selection process. So neither of these motions, it has merit to it. I'd be very surprised if this put the trial off. Um, it does, to your point, Nicole, though, really signal how much Donald Trump does not want the public to see so the facts at a trial. Um, remember, he has already been given all of the evidence, all of the witness statements of what they're going to say. No, he has not, okay? We just read the motion. We just read the filings. They, they, they're not giving them anything, and they are not even responding to subpoenas, okay? Stormy has a valid subpoena. Rosenberg has a valid subpoena. Pomerantz trying to quash it. At least he's responding to it. The others are just ignoring it and there's no recourse at all. So why is Todd Blanche, okay, at blanchelaw.com, Andrew, why is he publishing all of the filings? Why isn't the court doing that? Because Trump's team, Trump's lawyers want everybody to see this. In fact, we'd like to turn the camera on if you could. Trump is gagged. Dude, are you nuts? He can't even speak about this case. He's ready to talk about this case 24 seven, but he can't even talk about it now. So who's trying to gag who, okay? Why do we have to redact all of those pages in those filings? You know why? To protect Michael Cohen, to protect the convicted perjurer and a porn star, Stormy Daniels, from their cavorting, whatever was going on there with their communications and their podcasts. Ugh. So enough of him, but you get the point. They're going to continue to sell it to their audience that Trump is trying to delay, 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 delay. 
They drop hundreds of thousands of pages on the defense. It is not possible to defend a case when you're in an environment that is so rigged this way. Hey, you know, show up for a test and now you also have to read 100,000 pages the night before because you're about to be quizzed on it. It's not possible to do that for this defense. And, you know, they'll try to get through it. Trial starting on the, on the 15th. They'll see if there's anything in there. But this is by design. Right? It's to overwhelm them and to try to secure a victory here by mucking up the, the process, mucking up the waters, and having a complicit judge who is refusing to even enforce subpoenas so that Trump has a fair day in court. Now, my friends, we're going to be here continuing to cover this. I hope you join us as we do all the Trump litigation, the Trump trials. It's going to be a busy year for us, and we hope you join us as we unpack all of this. Thank you for subscribing, for liking this video, for sharing our channel with a friend or family member. Thanks for also coming over and looking at our members-only community, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We do great streams in the morning where we dive into some other topics that we can't always get to here. We have a great community of amazing people there. We do streams on Saturday. We do after parties. It's a great way to support the show, get some extra content, meet some amazing people, and have some fun. We'd love to have you join us. Watching the Watchers dot locals dot com links down in the description and of course we'll see you over there and back here on the next one all right my friends and we got one final segment on the day and this time we're going down to florida to georgia gotta get my states right in georgia we've got an appeal Trump's defense team is now appealing Judge McAfee, not on the disqualification issue, which is currently working its way up the Court of Appeals, but on another motion to dismiss based on the First Amendment, saying Trump is protected by our Constitution for the conduct that Fannie alleges is criminal. She says it was a bunch of speech, speaking, and that as the president, he doesn't have the right to do those things. And so the defense is scratching their heads saying, how about we appeal this thing? And they've done that. You remember Steve Sadow, the Georgia Bulldog over there, who was in court and doing a great job. Here is his announcement on this initial step of the appeal. He says, President Trump and others who are unjustly accused defendants have now jointly filed a motion requesting that the court grant a certificate of immediate review. Remember in Georgia, we got to get permission from both sides. The lower level court has to give us the thumbs up. Court of Appeals has to give us a thumbs up and then we take it from there. Grant a certificate of review of its order denying their pretrial First Amendment challenges which, which the defense submitted. We covered that here previously. Now the motion, says Steve, powerfully expresses that this indictment from Big Fanny wrongfully criminalizes core political speech and expressive conduct that's all protected by the First Amendment. There is no democracy, says Steve, without robust and uninhibited freedom of expression. And for these reasons, among others, the court order is ripe for pretrial appellate review. This is what Sadow says. In the Big Fanny prosecution, Fulton County, Georgia, state of Georgia versus Trump, this is the motion for a certificate of immediate review appealing the denial of the motion to dismiss the case based on the First Amendment. Now, remember McAfee came out here and on April 4th, he issued an order and that order addresses whether the Constitution bars this indictment here under the First Amendment and under the Georgia Constitution. Now, while McAfee held that this indictment is not subject to a dismissal here and that the challenge criminal statutes withstand Trump's challenges, he did say that apparently, that and, and as applied, interlocutory appellate review of defendants, quote, vital constitutional protections, they say, is both prudent and warranted. And again, we're here in the middle of a criminal case. So we call this an interlocutory appellate review. Most criminal appeals come after the conclusion of a trial. But this, we're doing it in the middle because you can't redo the, the election, right? If Trump is bogged down in a criminal prosecution in the middle of a, an election, there are collateral consequences to that. So they say this is prudent. The Court of Appeals should accept this in Georgia because if successful, 
If they win, it would bar virtually every count of the indictment against virtually every defendant. Resolution of these issues is important. We need to get this settled before we have multiple lengthy jury trials with 19 co-defendants, which is down to 15. So both sides. Now this challenge relates to core political speech and it also relates to the 2020 presidential election. So it's free speech combined with a, a very important election. Now, while the defendants cited a plethora of U.S. Supreme Court cases that McAfee's like, whatever. No Georgia appellate courts have even addressed this. Whether a Georgia statute can survive the criminalization of defendants' core political speech. We get some case law here, and they tell us that here's what Trump's argument is along with the other co-defendants. They say that their challenged speech is core political speech related to an election, right? Fannie said that there was a conspiracy. Trump said a bunch of things that led to a conspiracy. No, that's not criminal language. That's political speech. Now, other than Trump's speech that led to this so-called conspiracy, the indictment does not challenge or point to any other activity that subjects them to prosecution. And even if the indictment alleges that the speech was knowingly or willfully false, which is what the law requires the court to assume, their speech is still protected by the First Amendment. Again, other than saying that the defendant's speech violated some criminal statutes, the indictment does not specify what other criminal conduct aside from the speech was committed here. It's just speech. Like, like that's the actual conduct. Now, based on more than 45, mostly U.S. Supreme Court cases and other historic precedent, the defense believes that their arguments are well-founded and they fall squarely within the almost absolute First Amendment protections in the context of other core political speech in the context of the 2020 election. Now, there are no cases cited by this court or by Fannie in which a statute that criminalizes core political speech survives First Amendment strict scrutiny. So there's no other good examples. Thus, what appears to be a sui generis finding in the April order, like of its first impression, based on a novel legal theory by the state cries out for an immediate review. So the, saying, the judge, this is the first time you've addressed this. This is the first time this has been brought up in Georgia. And so it is subject to review. We need another court to take a look at this thing and make sure that we're okay here. Now, importantly, they say McAfee's order questions without finding whether the speech alleged in the indictment was in fact political. He's like, I don't know. McAfee said, the defense is not presented, nor is the court able to find any authority that the speech and the conduct alleged is protected speech. But the deluge of case law cited by Trump does plainly characterize the speech alleged in the indictment as protected. Like, read the cases, judge. Now, the court is aware, however, and they're correct, that Georgia appellate courts have not directly addressed this especially as it comes to challenges made under the Electoral Count Act, like the type of speech is about the election, about the Electoral Count Act, like we haven't have any cases on point to that. And Georgia appellate courts have not addressed this at all. So the legal question about the nature and the characterization of the speech at issue is outcome determinative, meaning it's going to dispose of this case. We're going to have a decision if we decide this legal issue. And so the question of what type of speech is targeted in the indictment and in the statute, it demands review. Whether the statements in the indictment are political in nature is a question of law for the courts to decide. And how's, how do we decide that? Well, courts are compelled to examine statements and they're de determining whether they're a character of which the principles of the First Amendment apply. For example, in the criminal context, Quote, a prosecution motivated by a desire to discourage expression that's protected by the First Amendment is barred and it must be enjoined, irrespective of whether the challenged action could possibly be found to be unlawful. Saying numerous other decisions rendered in related First Amendment contexts also illustrate the legal nature of speech characterizations. How do we quantify the speech? 
and it's a tough question that we have to analyze. And that's why the Court of Appeals needs to hear this. Additionally, the court says that there is a broad principle that there is, quote, speech integral to criminal conduct, fraud, or speech presenting an immunity threat is not protected. There are exceptions to free speech. Now, again, the court and the state rely on only cases outside the context of political speech. It's not, it's not about political speech, the cases that they're relying on. And so they apply a lower standard other than strict scrutiny. As the Arneson Court, citing U.S. Supreme Court precedent, makes clear, political speech is in the context that is subject to strict scrutiny review, the highest level of scrutiny under our jurisprudence. And in this context, the speech at issue about the 2020 election is absolutely protected because the sole criminal allegations are premised upon the speech itself. So we need the Court of Appeals to help us figure this out. And in this context, this, quote, integral to illegal conduct, conduct exception just does not apply here. And neither the state nor the court wrestled with this context. The best understanding of integral to illegal conduct exception is this. When speech, the speech tends to cause, attempts to cause, or makes a threat to cause some illegal conduct right? It's the conduct. The speech relates to conduct. Like it's solicitation of drugs, but there's drugs there that you're going to solicit to buy. So it's going to transfer the drug, right? There's an underlying conduct. It's not just solicitation now, or like solicitation of prostitution, same thing. There's an act there that you're about to go engage in. It's not just the thing. It's like murders, fights of, res of tr restraints of trade, child abuse, discriminatory refusal to hire. Okay, those are the types of speech that are in furtherance of illegal conduct. That's not what Trump has done here. But the scope of these restrictions must still be narrowly defined. Now, nowhere in Fannie's indictment, nor where in the April 4th order, does anyone point to any illegal conduct other than the prohibited speech itself. So it is a statute that criminalizes speech. That's illegal. Now, our review also reveals none. But rather, Fannie says that because it pled that Trump's speech allegedly violates other statutes, it's integral to those statutes. Now, this is novel. It's purely circular. And the theory needs to be vetted by the higher courts. For if it is accurate, then any First Amendment challenges are dead on arrival. And they can never support a demur in Georgia, which is the challenging of the indictment. That's because the, to hurdle the First Amendment barriers to speech, the high barriers, all the state would need to do is just say, oh, it's a RICO violation. There you go. No protections. Now, if that's the case, and this court seems to think it is, that would vitiate First Amendment challenges all over the place. And this is not appropriate. It's core political speech. And this court already recognized the clear importance of the vital constitutional protections at play. And so Trump's First Amendment challenges are of paramount concern for both the efficient resolution of this matter and for the protection of Trump's First Amendment rights. This is especially true given that there's very little guidance on this. And this is why the Georgia Court of Appeals needs to hear this case respectfully submitted to Judge Scott McAfee by Christopher S. Anilwich from Georgia and other defense attorneys like Steve Sadow, Ashley Merchant, boom right there, and the, the amazing defense attorneys on the RICO case all seen here. So that got submitted in. And what we're, we're waiting for now is for Judge McAfee to grant permission to say, okay, great. You're right. This is a novel issue. It's a complicated question of law. There is no precedent here. And so permission granted. Why don't you take that up to the Court of Appeals? And then we'll see if the Court of Appeals ultimately accepts that. But again, we're waiting for one of these appeals to take, because if it does, then there's a question about whether the underlying prosecution is stayed, held in abeyance until we get conclusions on these. And then that would postpone the Georgia trial until certainly beyond the election. So we're going to be here continuing to cover this, my friends. We've got Vivek here who has a little bit of optimism to share in the face of all these prosecutions. 
saying that if people can just compare side by side Joe Biden's performance versus Donald Trump's performance, it's pretty easy to see who's competent, who's capable, and hopefully our fellow Americans recognize this, see this, and vote accordingly. The unique part of this election, this is historic, and I just want to say this on a positive note. We only get this once in a century where voters get to choose between two presidents who have both been the president before. That doesn't happen usually. It was Grover Cleveland the last time around. So that's a unique opportunity in this election that voters have at the top of the ticket to say, it's not a challenger to Biden who's offering you hopes and dreams. It's a challenger to Biden who's already done it. Compare four years of Trump to four years of Biden. That's a once in a century opportunity. And if voters seize that, I think we can have a landslide that unites this country that's what this country needs. And as Donald Trump has said, and I love it when he says this, success will be our vengeance. That's, That's right, how baby. we're going to be the party. B Biden promised to unite the country. He didn't do it. That's what Republicans are going to do this year. And I think that's how we're going to make our nation greater than it's ever been before so that our best days are mm -hmm. still ahead of us. I truly believe that. And All right. So shout out to Vivek with a little bit of optimism and positivity there. I think these people are exposing themselves. I think that they've bitten off way more they can chew. You know, if somebody did something criminal, you don't have to have a whole public relations campaign to do it. You don't need to have Liz Cheney come out and have eight different book reports that she has with Benny Thompson to fake a narrative for the whole country to buy. They know they're illegitimate. They know they lack credibility and that people are waking up. So they're freaked out. They're using all their last levers of power in order to get this thing worked out. It's like that end scene at Terminator with a T-1000 flailing around and they're just trying to escape the, the momentum here because people are recognizing how corrupt and partisan these all are. We see it and more people are seeing it every day. And we're going to be here continuing to cover all of this litigation throughout the election season and beyond. And we're grateful that you join us. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you for liking this video, for sharing it with a friend or family member for inviting them to come join us for our live streams. We're grateful for your recommendations. We also have some great links down in the description below, including watchingthewatchers.locals.com, our members only community, where we do live streams in the morning, streams on Saturday. We have an amazing community there. We talk about a bunch of other stuff that we can't get to here, and we would love to see you join us. So come check us out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. My friends, we'll see you over there, and we'll see you back here on the next one. All right, my friends. Well, that is it for us on the day. We covered some good ground. An appeal in Big Fanny's jurisdiction. Trump subpoenas Stormy Daniels footage. Not that kind. And we've got Judge Mercon releasing the jury rules. And as we saw, clearly targeting the Trumpers who could make it onto the panel. But now, my friends, it is time to hear from you and to see what you have to say about this. Very grateful for your amazing support. Thank you so much for sending in those super chats and all the amazing support. We had some great way to start the day off was with Jennifer. What's up, Jennifer? Bringing in new Membos. Jennifer's bringing in five Membos. Mainers joining us. Jay Leap, we got G Usury. We got Silent Rage and Sheila P. All coming in, courtesy of Jennifer, who's a Membo, bringing in new Membos, and we're grateful to have you here. We got this one from Catania Mama Italia, a Membo, reminding us, smash that like button, and we're grateful for Catania's reminder on that. Tony is here. Hey, hey, it's the Monkets is in the house. Tony Hay is bringing in Will H. Carolyn H. is coming here. Brenna B. We got Mama Pillows in the house, and not crazy, not too crazy is joining us courtesy of Tony Hay Munkets in the house. Bodie's here. Have you seen what's going on with Elon and Brazil? I have seen that. Yeah, that is turning into a wild scene. Apparently Elon is like trying to get the ex employees out of there because he's under threat of a tyrannical judge who's going to uh, claiming he's part of a criminal organization or something. Total dictatorship there turning into a psychopathville fun. Shout out to our friends in Brazil. Luke C says, did we get to review Good Logic's motion? Didn't he submit it this afternoon? Hopefully we get to see that soon. We have not reviewed it here yet. Uh, uh, not yet, no. Good Logic, I believe, is still working on it. And I know he is working hard on it. 
and we're going to be supporting him as he does. So I think he's putting the finishing touches on it, and I'm not sure what the latest is. You're going to have to go over to Good Logic's channel to check it out. He's right next door on YouTube, on Rumble, and on Locals. He's doing some great work. I have seen some of it, and it's good, baby. He's a sharp dude, so check it out. Good Logic is covering all of these cases. He's in New York, and he is going to be in the thick of it here very soon in a good way. What's up, Chris W.? A new supporter on the YouTubes. Great to have you, Chris. Excited to see you tomorrow morning. We got Roger Needham is here. Good to see you, Roger. Bringing in Jason F., Danny M., Space Babies here. Ava R. and Sue, all gifted members, courtesy of Roger and Roger Needham in the house. Thank you, Roger. Very generous. Grateful to have you here. We've got... We got John McGarvey is clipping for us today. Radice. Hey, what's up, Radice? Look at these. We got some books from our friend Vienticus. Hey, Gino told me to get off the tubes and start reading to him. VP won't sign them. I'm going to have to splash bacon grease on them instead. Well, if you can't get V's original autograph, the next best thing is bacon grease. Hey, here's a nice photo. Those are all of Vienticus's books available at Barnes & Nobles. The Last Enchantress. I don't know if they're still available or not but you're going to have to search for him. It's a rare collector's item. If you got him, you got him. Chris W is here. What's up, Chris? Bringing in new membos. Thank you, Chris. We got Dig M is here. What's up, Dig? We got jo Joni M, Jake D, Victor R, and Andrew C. All gifted membos, courtesy of our friend Chris, who is a membo. Thank you to Chris W for bringing in the newest of membos. We got Roger N says, the judge should also just keep his oath. Yeah, that's a pretty good uh, default position. You know, just keep your oath. It's a pretty good idea. It would be nice to see a lot more of that. Oh, my goodness. John McGarvey. Look at all these membos. Courtesy of John McGarvey, who does help mod the fort down for us. Thank you, John. Look at this. Very generous, John. John McGarvey is bringing in TJH, Jane F, Thomas C, Save America. Trump is coming in. Chris N, Annie R, James B, Brittany Z is here. Magic Stick, N, Navy S, FSU Mike, Susan K, Sarah H, Eric's is here, Scott D, Calbo D, Wolves Lair, Renee C, Last of Yahoo's, and Randall W, all gifted membos, courtesy of a John McGarvey. Thank you, John, for everything you do around here, my man. We appreciate you. We got this one from Jeffrey A, says, Rob, if Trump flies to Florida during jury deliberations, and refuses to return to New York. I believe that Ron stated that Florida would not honor a New York extradition request for Trump. What would happen? Well, I don't know if that would be real beneficial. I mean, first of all, I don't know what the judge would do. I don't know if, well, he would probably issue a warrant and uh, then we'd have a serious problem. Yeah, he'd probably issue a warrant. Like, it would be the same thing, I think, either way. If Trump, like, if, if he orders Trump to jail and Trump says no, we're going to have a standoff. If Trump decides he's not going to go and be a part of this process because he's got a campaign or something, we're going to have a standoff. So it would be a standoff, and we don't know where it would go. And, yeah, you're right. I mean, if, if he's hunkered down in Florida, maybe Florida does not honor New York extradition requests, and that's the end of it. It's a good question. Hopefully it doesn't come to that, but good. We got Rain is here. says the judge is literally admitting Trump cannot get a fair trial, so he is changing the rules. Yeah, Trump has no evidence. Trump has no time. Trump has no access. It's just a total charade. We got, what's up, Roger Needham says, should the jury in these trials be independents or people that have never voted to increase the likelihood of impartiality? Yeah, I think that I would be more fair, right? I don't know that independents are necessarily independents. You know, I think that they're fakers, a lot of them. What does that even mean? An independent, like pick an issue. Like, do you have any, do you have any opinions? What, do you have an opinion on anything? Okay, well, what is your opinion? Okay, then great. Then you have a, an opinion. You're not an independent. Independence. Pick a side, okay? We're, 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 you know, pick a side. We got a country to save here. Enough, enough of this already. All right. So, yeah, but maybe non-political people or apolitical people who haven't participated, you know, more neutral. 
but you're not going to get that in New York. What's up, Roger? Thank you for that. Bad Poet says, MSNBC instant strike to balance truth. Instant strike to balance truth. Oh, I see. Yeah. Instant strike. Yes. So truth or MSNBC, you got to go. You're off the case. You're off the jury. I got it. Hey, travel agent Amy, who's a great travel agent. If you need one, you should contact her. Says it depends on what you mean by voted for and listened to on the jury questions. And what does voting for mean? Like the first time I voted or, or what? Knox is here. What's up, Knox? Says happy Tuesday, all. I thought this meme was nice. Here, here's a meme. Says, we have responsibility to stand watch over one another. We are watchers, all of us. Watchers guarding against the darkness. I like it. That's exactly right. That's exactly what we're doing here. What a great meme. And that's right. We're shining the spotlight down upon the dark, corrupt, corroded gutters of our justice system. We do have a responsibility. You know, it's, 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 our, uh, it's our sacred duty to our fellow man. And we're not saving everybody here, but we are saving the people who are, believe in freedom and are aligned with American values. And we have to watch over each other and stand up for one another. That's how we win. The other side's not going to do that, okay? That's why when we talk about this being a generational effort, I don't know that they're going to have another generation because of their genitals. Yeah. Hey, a bad poet says, somebody is going to figure out, thank you, Knox, somebody is going to figure out Cohen was indicting Stormy. They were podcasting together. Cohen and Stormy were podcasting. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, why don't you come over for a podcast? <laughs> and paying her with Trump's money. That's by far the most likely story. That's by far the most likely story from Bad Poet. Hey, DJ says, Tish James is trying not to accept the $175 bond because of the company that President Trump went to get. I think I saw that st story. Yeah, she's trying to start seizing properties any day now. Cup O Sooth, what's up? These are from our Rumble friends. What's up, DJ? Thank you for that from Rumble. And we got Cup O Sooth says, thanks to Alvin Bragg, you can pay a worker to put something in her mouth, but not to keep something out of it. Oh my gosh, from Cup O Sooth. It's just incredible. Dolphin fan is the man bringing in five new membos, including Doctor Who, Eric is here. Puppet is here. We got Angie Erickson, not a bot is in the house. And Red is joining us, courtesy of Dolphin Fan is the man in the house. We got Salty Sarge says, the old song by Charlie's Daniel Band, the devil went down to Georgia, was prophetic. Trump will end up with a fiddle of gold while evildoers lose their soul from Salty Sarge. Great comment, Salty. Thanks for saying that over on Rumble. Very nice to have you. Glocky's here says people that voted for Biden want your kids to go to war, but want to give their kids free college while taking it away from Americans who earned it. How ironic is that? Army's premier education benefits may be on the chopping block with tuition assistant cuts being considered too. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just a disaster everywhere, isn't it? Hey, what's up? Ray Ronk. Been a membo for six months, two thirds of the way to a baby, says two thirds of the way. And from Brazil, Lula's a dictator from our friend Ray. I don't know what's going on down there, man, but I read some of that judge's order and it was like crazy talk. What he's doing to Elon and Elon's like not backing down. So it's going to be a, a spicy little meatball there. And thanks for saying that, Ray. Thanks for being a membo for six months. We're grateful for you. We've got Ruth S is our newest supporter. What's up, Ruth? We'll see you tomorrow morning on our members only stream in the morning. Thanks for joining and excited to meet you and see you. Sandy says on locals, I plan to follow the Brazil situation closely. I hope everyone keeps eyes on it. Yeah, it's probably another canary in the coal mine, so to speak, something that's coming down the pike for all of us. And Sean Stefano says, I hate both parties. Yeah, that's true. I was probably a little harsh on the independents, you know, out there. I'm fine if you're an independent, I'm fine with independence as long as you don't vote Democrat, okay? That's fine. You can be independent as long as you want. Just don't vote Democrat, okay? That's ridiculous. Their party is 
a disaster, okay? Just a terrible disaster. I don't know what what's going on in your head if you're an independent. Just don't vote for them. Vote for RK if you have to. Just don't vote for them. And then we'll, uh, you know, we'll just leave it at that. Hey, Melanie's here. Melanie says, sending support. Thank you for all that you do, Rob. And that's going to be dropping up on the screen right here. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you for all you do, Rob. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks for being a Membo. And we're grateful to have you, Melanie. And my friends, thank you for sending in all those donos. Very generous of you. Very grateful for your support. You know, we could not do this or be here without you supporting us, however you do that. And so we're grateful for that. Let's say hello to our friends on X and see who's over there before we go over to watching the watchers locals.com for our members only after party where we're going to continue this conversation and debrief the rest of the show. Salty Sarge says, Hey, this judge from Brazil is evil. L says, thanks for your presentation. No way that Trump gets a fair trial. Fred says, I used to serve subpoenas for attorneys. They attach cash to them to pay to send the documents back in the mail. Oh, I see Fred. It's a service thing. I see what you're saying. I'm keeping your money. So he did get served and he's acknowledging he got the money. Goofy for Jesus says, great stream. Thanks so much. Good to see you, Goofy. And Raven says, you know, I'm sure you've seen this by now, but if it, anyone is under a rock, it makes my blood boil. Here's a former CIA employee talking about how they set people up like Alex Jones, Tucker Carlson, and others. Uh, Azok says, uh, still looking spiffy today. Still don't see your cup of tea, pinky in or pinky out. When I drink tea, is the pinky in or out? I don't know. We don't drink a lot of tea here, you know, in Arizona. It's a good question. I don't know. What's the rule? Mel, is there is there a proper etiquette in British, in Britain, when you guys drink your tea with your hats on? You know, those like white hats that you guys all walk around in? I'm pretty sure that's how it is over there, right? Melanie says... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Ask about your jab status on the jury. Are you jabbed or not? Oh, you're not. Okay. You're off the case. Goodbye. Ask about medical status. So how fun is that? All right, my friends, thank you for those great comments over on the X platform. We like to plug the X platform so we can connect other people out there in the wilderness on X. Follow us over there if you want to follow along, but that is it for us on the day. And we are going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only after party. We would love to see you over there. Come and join us. We do have Arizona iced tea, but you drink that from a giant can. So that's pinky in for sure. You know, you don't drink Arizona iced tea like a big can. I don't know, maybe some people do. I don't think, I don't think pinky outs for that though. <sighs> I think pinky in for those. But anyways, all right, so watching the watchers, dot locals dot com pinky and i think yeah for, especially for the arizona iced tea i'm talking about like the little like the little tea things you know like a little tea and crumpets you know whatever they do over there in england i don't know it's i don't know it's a whole it's a foreign country robert dot com if you want to uh, sign up for our daily newsletter get the email delivered to your inbox every day and and, and just have an absolute joy reading it and opening it up might be the best email you look at every single day so check that out we've also got watcherlodge.com come and join us sovereignty saturdays we're talking about solutions we're talking about becoming free creating anti-fragility in our lives and it's all free come join us watcherlodge.com on saturday for our saturday streams we want to thank the mods and the meme smiths who are in the house today including our Membos, our newest mods and meme smiths. We added, we, we made some adjustments on this. We had some retires and we added Economy Pilot, who is also, I believe, helping to clip us. And so we're thanking all the amazing people who helped keep the train on the track here. Our friends, Donut Mind Me, clipping away hard for us. Economy Pilot, Dog Digger, Janek. We got Zach Nichols, Ronnie Cole, Playing Hooky, just cause and K Bean in the house, modding down the fort for us. We're grateful to our meme smiths, Sleepy Dog Lee, Nathan N810, and Gigum Gigum for modding the fort down for us and keeping things nice and orderly in the chat. But my friends, that is it. 
for us on the day. And we are going to leave it there. We are going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only after party. We'd love to see you there. But if not, well, we're going to be back here tomorrow to get into it all again. And we need to see you right back here so that together, with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. See you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you.